This is the Al Franken Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. Hey, everybody, we got a great one today, you know, for a change. You know, normally I don't talk about today's news. I, I, I kind of go into issues. For example, one of our guests is Nancy Gertner, professor at, at Harvard Law, a position she got because she's uh, 100% Ashkenazi Jew. And uh, we did uh, one after Kavanaugh, and we did it on the Federalist Society. So we did something that wasn't right on the nose, okay? And and by the way, this isn't going to be today's news because this will air in a few days, so it will be outdated. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we have two great guests, uh, as I said, uh, uh, Nancy uh, Gertner, professor at the Harvard Law School, and also a uh, federal judge for 12 years, Nancy? 11 years. And also with us is Max Bergman, who is director of the Moscow Project at the Center for American Progress, and the Moscow Project. Uh, has been doing a deep dive into uh, Russian interference into our election, if there if there was any, and um, Judiciary Committee in the House met, and, and many of the Republicans don't think <laughs> there was interference. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. On you, the committee Ukraine, today, Ukraine did it. Is the the yeah. line that is still emanating That's from so many of them? That's so crazy, right? That's For crazy. no apparent reason. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. As anyway, part of a Ukrainian plot to take over the world. <laughs> so I think we're going to talk about we're I, we're going to go far afield today. I want to I do want to talk about obviously where we're going here on the impeachment, but I also want to talk about a bar, uh, which is uh, related because of the FBI and his uh, <laughs> uh, his introduction of the Mueller report a couple hours before it was released, saying that uh, the report had concluded that the the Trump administration had uh, completely cooperated. I'm going to start with, with, with the uh, phone call on July 25th uh, between uh, Trump and Zelensky, which we have the transcript of. Effectively, and, yeah. Yeah, and I guess people who listened to it have said that it's pretty accurate, right? Yeah, there was one... Zinman said something. Yeah, Zinman said... Look, there were things that I actually heard and and put in to add. You know, I heard, he heard Barisma. He heard the mentioning of of uh, of additional context. So he put it into the initial draft. He, of the transcript? he he submitted edits to the transcript, and, and then did they get in. He they did not no. get in. Oh, oh, oh that so what we so hence we have these weird ellipses in certain parts of the transcript, which. Um, so the way it works is it's not recorded, and so why you, not? I. I, Are you sure about that? By the way, yeah, uh, and uh, I and so you have a number of people listening in and indirectly sure? transcribing. That's my you know understanding of it. Because that's that was my next question: Is there an audio, and why haven't we heard it? If there had been an audio which is not produced after all of this, all of these hearings, that would be a scandal. That would have been something. So they they report that there's no audio, and you know we have to assume that that's correct. Former NSC staffers from the Obama administration. Say that yeah, there was no audio, and I you know oh, okay. I worked in the yeah, State I Department trust. and would read yeah. call readouts, and there was there wasn't usually audio. Uh, people just reco- shoot. writing it down. Shoot, shoot, shoot. <laughs> I did I did a sketch once because the audio matters because yeah. you, then you hear what what he means and says right. Uh, because I did a sketch once on SNL where it was Nixon saying that he was just kidding, he was being sarcastic, mm-hmm. and we did the sketch where Aykroyd played Nixon. And, oh, we could do that. <laughs> you know, and they're <laughs> laughing. Okay, so you guys listened to, uh, Nancy, did you listen at all or watch the House Judiciary? Overheard, mostly listened, right, mostly listened. Listen, okay, you listened on the, the audio is all you needed, right. really. See, right. see how important the audio is? Right, right. Okay, uh, were you impressed? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Wow, wow. Well, I mean, you know, at this point, the arguments on both sides have been gone over so many times that they're really, no one is saying anything new under the sun except emoting on either side. You know, the, the, the Schiff hearings pretty much laid all of this out. This is a summary. And, you know, how you spin it depends on the side that you're on. It was a rehash, but every once in a while they'd come up with a new lie, right? 
uh, some guy toward the end, some Republican at the end, I can't remember uh, all their names, uh, said something that they didn't really know that the aid was being withheld because the call that was made right after the phone call, right before the phone call, one of the two, uh, was made by rogue elements of, (laughs) and this was like he was doing it like it was, we have, you know, we now know that. Yeah. We now know that, that it was was not people that would talk to Zelensky and tell him it's being withheld. So, Max, why don't you just get in, tell what that's about. Yeah, so... You know, there was this sort of confusion of whether the Ukrainians knew, you know, right when the call happened or, or shortly thereafter. Uh, frankly, it doesn't really matter because they would later find out before the aid was released that it was being held while they were being extorted. But we did learn in the hearings that took place that Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Laura Cooper, uh, said that her staff had been asked by the Ukrainians and if by the embassy here uh, by the embassy by the Ukrainian embassy here so it's hard to say that the Ukrainian well the embassy are rogue but they could be well I don't don't think they're so I think you know the Ukrainian embassy their job is literally to follow this uh, you know to be like white on rice to just be tracking this and let's remember this is security assistance this is not an arms sale it's assistance and what that means it's congressionally appropriated money. So what that means is Congress is knows, you know, is tracking what's happening with the money that's being spent. So there was murmurs going around the hill. There was murmurs going from DOD, on, from the State on, Department. On, oh, something's happening. Where's the money? Where's the money? And so questions are questions are being asked. Yeah. And then it's pretty clear in a lot of the te- text messages about what was happening in August. But then the what is critically clear is that in late August, there's a Politico story yes. that comes out and says the money's being held. And then immediately the advisor to Zelensky goes to Kurt Volker, the special envoy to Ukraine, and says, hey, can we talk? And sends a political story. What is going on here? And Kurt Volker responds, hi, Andre. Yes, we can. Yes. No, he happy actually to talk. said, hama hama. <laughs> that was his first word, hama hama. And uh, then and they it, released it. And, and I love that the Republicans say, they, I mean, the proof is they released it. Yeah, no harm, no foul. So, right. so wait a minute. Not only that, there, there couldn't have been, uh, couldn't have been ex- extortion at all because they they released it. Nothing happened. There's nothing to ha- Nothing happened here. Every drug dealer that was ever in front of me <laughs> accused of drug dealing, if the defense is you caught me in the act, I didn't complete the deal, therefore I'm out of here. I mean, that would be extraordinary. A lot of people would walk. Or, or. Or someone who goes to a park and wants to buy the drugs, right? It turns out that's an undercover cop. Right. That's right. He doesn't so, have so to they're... get the drugs to right, have committed right. a crime. Yeah. Right? right? Am I right? So this is a this is an attempt. Do I know, yeah. the <laughs> you know the law? Nancy? <laughs> yeah. Right, you do. You know, the, the the beginning the president was going on about whether it's there's a quid pro quo. You know, wh- whether you were saying aid in exchange for uh, investigations. Actually, there doesn't have to have been an, uh, a formal quid pro quo. Making the request of another country to investigate um, a, your political rival really goes a long way to an abuse of power. That he also said, otherwise we won't get to see you in the White House or otherwise you won't get the aid, is additional. But uh, that alone is an abuse of power. Okay. So that's a little moot. But um, the quid pro quo. Now, I didn't hear Mulvaney's name brought up. I was I was watching this thing a long time, and I didn't hear like, you know, the chief of staff said there was a quid pro quo, and 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 remember they uh, said, oh, uh, Sondland changed his testimony, as uh, he had to revise his testimony. Well, yeah, because the first time he withheld. And then he saw what everybody else testified, and he wanted to look. He didn't want to get uh, convicted of perjury, <laughs> <laughs> so he revised it. That's you know they're going like he revised it. And I, I think this is the one sort of question about the the articles uh, and whether the term abuse of power 
um, you know, it's sort of so broad that it doesn't sort of get specifically at what we were talking about over the last few months. Mm -hmm. Um, And it leads to a lot of legal questions that are sort of out of my writ. But we were talking, you know. Not mine. Yeah. (laughs) No, how about about Nancy Zeket to uh, a lot of legal questions? There are legal questions all over the place. (laughs) But But in terms of sort of whether to use bribery, uh, quid pro quo, extortion, uh, those terms which Democrats were hammering and part of sort of a clear message, I think you sort of see in the last few days, the message isn't as clear as it was early on. You know, they sort of stopped saying that if, if anyone else had done this, they'd be in jail or they'd be going to jail. That that has lost a little bit of the political punch, but I sort of deferred to Nancy. It's word. hard for anyone else to do this. This yeah. is the president of the United States saying we'll withhold well, when, aid unless when you Rod announce held the Senate seat right. up for sale. Right. He right. went to jail. So. I mean, I think can, if we can just step back, I mean, the notion of using taxpayer funds duly appropriated and deploying them for your against your political rival. That's what's going on. The question of how that happened. I mean, one is, you know, holding that up is an extortion. Extortion generally means coercion. Bribery is when you sort of try to solicit it. It is either, but it's, it's, it's holding up appropriated funds for a national security purpose in order to affect a personal political position. But one of the things that, that really strikes me, which is also lost in the debates, is that you know, in the law, we talk about inferences. I would instruct a jury about circumstantial evidence. You know, direct evidence is the the mailman is putting the mail in the box. Circumstantial evidence is the mail is in the box. I assume that the mailman came. The impropriety of this is nowhere more clear than the reaction of the civil servants. One after another, they understood what was going on, and they said, oh, my God, I've never heard of this before. So the so the, the impropriety of it was sort of clear whether one calls it extortion, bribery, or just the misuse of public funds, it was clear to them. And that's why they won't be testifying before the Senate, because well, it uh, probably right. because McConnell uh, doesn't want that to happen again. To see these unbelievably great people, he is like uh, Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, uh, could you give some guidance? Uh, we're thinking of calling. Fiona Hill? No! <laughs> right, right. Well, no. This, this is actually, I think, the first test for Mitt Romney and Susan Collins. Like, this is actually the test. Because they could bandy together to deny McConnell the majority to set the rules to have no witnesses. They, so, and so I think right. we'll find out right away whether they're just all going to act as one and this is just a big, Ooh. you know, cover up. Or and it's a simple that's a, majority? That's important. Yeah, a simple majority? That's my wow. understanding. It's a simple majority, set the rules. So if... Uh, if they could, you know, join together with Democrats to have a fair trial, then well, wait a minute. Then we should be that should be the story, dear Susan. Uh, you will lose your seat in Maine if you don't team up with Mitt Romney, and Mitt, you will be a disgrace forever. McConnell clearly wants this to be quick, easy, over, and, and, no witnesses, vote, and done. But and to my chagrin, so did. The House Democrats, and I want to ask you all this. And I, I got I I asked people for questions. I, I just went on Twitter, and a lot of them were about, well, why didn't we include any of the Mueller stuff? And and t- very tied to that is, uh, shouldn't we uh, hold Bill Barr responsible for just lying when he introduced that? When he introduced the Mueller report, or lying now about the Horowitz report? Oh, he well both both. Uh, those, yeah. th- those are those are a bunch of questions. I mean, presumably the Mueller information is in the language of the articles of impeachment that talk about pattern and practice, the obstruction article okay, that talks yeah. about pattern and practice. Um, and I think you know I think that the that the uh, Democrats made a determination that those who are in swing districts who were equivocal about the Mueller report and the Mueller report was itself equivocal about some things. That's because Mueller, the schmuck, at the end, he could have said, okay, the uh, Office of Legal Counsel says you can't indict the president, but if you could, I would. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's up to the House to uh, decide whether to impeach him. Why didn't he say that? He could have said that. He could. You know, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I think that there's a way in which both Mueller and Horowitz relied on a... 
um, a rational d- discussion, which does not happen now. So Mueller thought he could do on the one hand. On the other hand, oh. I'm not going to go out of lane. I'm only going to say those things. That I think are he had Comey disease. I think he had well, Comey disease. Yeah, and I think Horowitz, to some degree, thought he was dealing in a rational universe as well, in which he says, on bottom, this wasn't politically motivated, but there were these serious problems. And what he didn't understand, and I'm not saying he should have written it any differently, is that all the, 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 the line from the Republicans are going to be, here are these problems, and that's all. And then Barr, and even John Durham, who is this U.S. attorney that Barr selected, really went out of lane completely. Uh, and Horowitz said as much. I mean, it says something about how Barr is much more concerned about the news cycle than he is about the legitimacy of the process. That before Horowitz testifies, Barr is slamming the Horowitz report in the same way that Barr slammed the Mueller report. Yep. Why do you need to do that at that point when you have an incomplete criminal investigation? Duran hadn't finished it. Because Barr is more concerned with the news cycle and the way things appear than than really following the usual rules of the Department of Justice. You know, I, I think Democrats probably made I, I made an understandable decision not to include specific references to Mueller in the articles that they're going forth with. And the reason why is because they so botched it back in April. And yeah, and but it, and geez. so so when the Mueller report came out, I mean, it is the most damning report ever written about official report ever written about a president of the United States. It has ten clear cases of obstruction of justice. Okay, it so has one hundred ninety-eight he... pages about collusion with Russia, and yet we have all been sort of gaslit over the last eight months that nothing was in it. And right. you know, we have a whole podcast called "The Asset" that was about essentially Trump's ties to Russia. But Democrats made a decision in April. And this was from leadership, from moderates that just decided that they didn't want to fight this fight, that they didn't want to do impeachment when Ukraine came about. And why did Ukraine come about? Why did this extortion of Ukraine happen? He did it the day after Mueller testified. The day after Mueller testified because he thought he was home free. Because a dead fish testified. And so then when you had moderate Democrats come out for impeachment, they didn't want to relitigate effectively the black stain on their reputation, to be honest, was that it was clear what took place that the president worked with the Russians, colluded with the Russians, then Why couldn't they justice. have gone, just said, include, it's part of a pattern, including obstruction of justice, that uh, things like uh, telling uh, Don McGahn to tell Rosenstein to fire Mueller. Uh, you know, you know uh, this is why I think we got to go after Barr. And that the first question I got was from uh, Chris Cordell. He said, my question is, what is anyone going to do about Barr? Barr lied, lied, lied. Yeah. Before I, the Mueller report came out, he said I, that the Mueller report said that the, the Trump administration had completely cooperated. Yeah. Right. And he had said there was no collusion. There was plenty of collusion. And on page two of the Mueller report, it makes a distinction between conspiracy and collusion. He said, we're going about conspiracy because you can, that's a law. That's a federal law. You can get convicted of conspiracy. You can't be convicted of collusion. You can't be convicted of being in cahoots. You know, you're not going to hear Welcoming, right. right, You're not going to hear a jury going like, Your Honor, we find the defendant guilty of being in cahoots. There's a reason that they went to conspiracy because it's in federal statutes. So the fact that he said it, it concluded there was no collusion is is just false. What, what the hell do you think of Manafort giving Kalimnik polling the, data. the internal polling data? Right. That's not collusion? Here's the thing, and that's what I was saying, Mueller stayed in lane. Um, uh, you know, as a sort of rigorous prosecutor, what he finds is that the Trump administration was welcoming this support from Russia, even angling for it. But you can't say he couldn't find, at least at that point, that they had coordinated with the Russians in advance. What's interesting about this Ukraine story is Trump was coordinating with the Ukrainians in advance. In other words, whatever the deficiencies were in the Mueller report about conspiracy to do something illegal is present in the Ukrainian story where Trump is the, is a, is doing it. And his co-conspirators are the three amigos, um, as well as, as you know, everyone else in the higher echelon of the cabinet. 
And you, you can't deny that they were conspiring uh, on the same page because everyone in OMB and all of the, except Mulvaney, and the, the various people who were Foreign Service, there was no appropriate reason for withholding this aid at all. Uh, you know, whatever corruption issues had already been addressed, and there was no appropriate aid, and no one understood why. And the only inference, apart from the explicit statements, but the only reasonable inference is the one that everyone drew who overheard what was going on, which is it was being held up uh, because they needed to say stuff about the Biden investigation and they needed to say stuff about the 2016 election. Yeah, I think Barr is such an insidious actor. I mean, effectively, his letter that came out was in March, a month before the Mueller report was released, was effectively giving Republicans their talking points about how they could sort of message the report. And they spent a month doing that. But the Horowitz report, I mean, the conversation that we were having this week is totally insane. The idea that the FBI was out to get Trump, that was well, what, he said something about uh, sending someone in a wire with a wire in there. Yeah. That's that's improper. And, then it was, and no one did that. And let's be clear. The Mueller investigation, the special counsel investigation may have been the most successful special counsel investigation in history. You had 37 indictments. The president's national security advisor, campaign chairman, deputy campaign chairman. I don't care if it was, you know, they started the investigation on a hunch. But no, it led to crimes being revealed. And what this including. Is, Indictments of like 13 Russians. It's also the FBI sort of, I think, gets off here in a way because we all want to defend the FBI because the Republicans are attacking the FBI. Trump is attacking the FBI. But the FBI was asleep at the switch in 2016. They were focused on Hillary Clinton's emails. They had more people investigating that in the counterintelligence division, then investigating Russian interference tied to the Trump campaign. And that's what was one of the things that was exposed in the Horowitz report. And it is utterly baffling to me. And then what was revealed 11 days before the election? Well, a reopening of the Clinton email investigation. But then on October 31st, we had the New York Times story that came out that says FBI investigates Trump links to Russia and and sees no links. And it was a totally baffling story. And what we see is that the FBI basically fell down on the job uh, in 2016. And so when you have Mueller begin his investigation in May. But but wait a minute. Didn't we have intelligence uh, people telling the Obama administration that there was Russian interference? uh, And I was in the government. There was awareness that Russians were interfering. What did you do in the government? So I was working at the State Department. I worked on uh, essentially security cooperation. Did so a you're I, part of the deep, deep state. Well, Ukraine security cooperation was something I worked uh, heavily on. But I, there was a sense that, oh, my God, the Russians are interfering. Now, we didn't, in the State Department, we had no idea that, that, uh, that there may be ties to the Trump campaign. Christopher Steele, who had you know, provided his dossier to actually a couple people within the State Department, but it wasn't, you know, spread out. Well, but, who I know that when when the administration went to McConnell and to the House. Yeah. Yeah. They went to McConnell it. and said they wanted to have a joint bipartisan statement that basically s- says Russia to cut it out. And it would be more effective if it came from both sides. So there was clear awareness that the Russians were interfering. And right. this is That's my point is that the FBI wasn't you know, was sort of decided, and this is what the text messages between Page and Strzok show. It's a debate about how forceful to engage in investigation against one of the president presidential candidates. It's a very tough role, but they decided to go slow to keep it as sort of a normal counterintelligence investigation that can take years. And so what happened is that after the after the election, when it all comes out in January of 2017, the Steele dossier, the intelligence community report, now, the Steele dossier, they use all the time as the, to discredit. They say Steele dossier, and everybody on their side goes, Shit, yeah, the Steele dossier, that shows you how phony all this was. So tell me about the Steele dossier. So the Steele dossier was just raw intelli- human intelligence, and it's the sort of thing I would read in the State Department every morning. And you have to take it with sort of a degree of skepticism because it's reporting on rumors. It's reporting on hearsay. Someone heard X from individual Y. And so it's completely, you know, inadmissible in any sort of court of law. It's it's intelligence and you have to assess it. And I think what Steele was basically the whistleblower. 
He was identifying that, oh my God, there's something going on here. Now, some of the details might have been slightly off. Most of them have actually been been borne out. But what happened when his dossier was revealed publicly in January is that the Trump folks could delete emails, could wipe servers, things could go dark. And so by the time Mueller became special prosecutor uh, in May, well, the you know, and this is in the Mueller report that they, you know, they went to Steve Bannon and couldn't find text messages that, you know, that took place during the transition. And Comey was in charge of it, the investigation. And Comey before. was in charge of it before. But it, as it became public in the early days of 2017, it gave, you know, it gave people opportunities to sort of go back and be like, well, if I'm subpoenaed or anything happens, I'm going, you know, you start removing messages. And there were, a lot of that took place. Aren't they on the hard drive, though? Yeah. I've, I've watched uh, uh, some <laughs> uh, of these kind apparently, of shows. Uh, apparently not. But, <laughs> but, but what basically happened was that the expectations for Mueller became sort of completely untethered to reality. That right. this guy was going to basically solve the JFK assassination or, you know, who killed Jimmy Hoffa. I guess we know who killed JFK. But, but yeah, and it was, he, was, he was all-knowing because we have this sort of view that the intel community knows all. And in the end... He couldn't quite, you know, say that Manafort passing polling data to a Russian intelligence officer in or a suspected Russian intelligence officer in August in the midst of the campaign, telling him which states they're focused on was to help the Russian influence campaign. And there are so many re- outstanding questions that more. How, how is that answer. not? Because is there because internal Moore, polling? This is how crazy it is, because more couldn't tell, couldn't determine that the Russian intelligence agent had given it on to the individuals and you know at well, the, that were then uh, what would he have also, done he with do, he couldn't do the other side of it in other words he couldn't say that Manafort was not a rogue actor and that Manafort had been directed by the Trump campaign in other words you saw lots of context the question was whether or not they were coordinated they were a conspiracy in advance but you were you were getting to something which is very interesting which is we keep on forgetting here that you can't say that the FBI was weighing in against Trump when the critical issue during the election was Comey's comments about the Hillary email investigation. There was, if anything, a bending over backwards on the assumption that Hillary was going to win and they didn't want to look like they had supported her. And so in the public domain and in their decisions that they made, they were actually tanking her and keeping the, the, the Russian issues quiet. I uh, yelled at him for this. We we yeah, had it's extraordinary. Uh, it's in his book. We were in the, the skiff, and it was uh, after the election. And I went, "Why did you do that to Hillary?" And he said, "Well, if I hadn't, it would have been a catastrophe." And I went, "For who? For him? For right, him? Right. Because that's why I say that Mueller had Comey disease because they're looking at their I am, I'm Robert Mueller." And I'm James Comey. We have, uh, we're pure. I don't agree. I don't agree with you. (laughs) Well, I don't think, I mean, I think that Mueller, Mueller's mistake was that he assumed a different political climate than the one that he delivered the report. Well, you know what they say, when you assume you make an ass out of Uma Thurman. Oh, God. (laughs) Right. I mean, you know, I think, I think that he, when you read the Mueller report, what he is saying is, I can't, I can't sort of pull the trigger on this. I can't draw this conclusion. That is for the political branches. And then Barr spins the report, and the president spins the report, and they spin it successfully. Um, so that essentially, and then, and then Mueller didn't do a fabulous job when he uh, testified. What but, was that? You know, well, I mean, I think, I think he was, I think he was having trouble. To he lost, so, he's lost his stuff. Yeah, I, that's right. But I also disagree with you, Al, in a slightly different way. I, I think the thing. I'm the host. <laughs> I, <laughs> Comey would go out and do the press conference, slamming Hillary. And that and was the, that was yeah, and screwed the, up too. Yeah, that was completely screwed up. But Mueller operated inside the box, and what we know is that. Mueller didn't look at Trump's finances and it, why the finances were important is because why didn't he do that? I, and this is, I think, one of the big, big remaining mysteries. Trump spent sixty six million dollars of his own money in the 2016 election. The reason why you need to look at his finances is the way Russians interfere in elections, especially in Europe. You know, you, it's not through, laundering money. It's not just through disinformation, but it's through providing, you know, how do you support a candidate? You fund them. And so providing f- money into a campaign. And these guys, Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman, what are they indicted for? 
well, basically being fronts for Russian and Ukrainian money to come into the U.S. political system. There are all sorts of questions about the foreign money that was coming into the election. That's why when Trump was spending $66 million of his own money and he operates these you know, hotels and businesses where effectively look like vehicles for money laundering, where you have shady narco traffickers investing in Trump Panama, and then there's Trump Tower in Toronto that are tied to Russian uh, mob money. And and how how many condos did they buy in his right. building? Right. Well, so in in Florida, there was you know there was a study by Reuters in early 2017 that saw one third of the units were uh, Russian buyers. But then there's a whole other cast of shell companies that effectively you create a shell company in the Bahamas. Then you go buy five units of a building and suddenly you've just cleaned your cash and it's now in the U.S. Uh, US system. And so that was basically that's the Trump business model. So how he spent sixty six million dollars of his own money for a guy who's not that liquid is a critical question. And that's something Mueller didn't look into. And so what I think with Mueller, why? Why? I think Trump, there was this indication in 2018 that Mueller was going to subpoena the Deutsche Bank records. Right. And there's been reporting from David Ignatius that said that Trump told Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general, said, I'm going to fire Mueller if he looks into my finances. And Rosenstein told Mueller to not do it. I think Mueller knew from the moment he was in that he was on tenterhooks and and that this was the kids and the, and the finances were outside his charge. But he thought that he had enough. But I wonder whether or not Why? Barr, you know, there was a period of time when we knew the Barr, the Mueller report had been finished between that time and the time that it came out. I would love to know whether there were parts of that report that were affected by conversations with Barr, that Mueller believed that if he took out X or Y, you know, the report would be received better. And then Barr goes and does the opposite. I really wonder whether or not Mueller was uh, was was essentially double crossed in by the way the way Horowitz was double crossed that you know he shared as he was supposed to the report with members of the administration the appropriate members of the administration and nobody said change this or that then he issues it and then there's this torrent of criticism of it um, again, I think that he was outmaneuvered in the way Mueller was. These guys are playing yeah. it straight, and they don't. I think that would, it's really fascinating to to know what happened in that month period, uh, and whether you know some of the double negatives or triple negatives that you know we couldn't conclusively say that he did not do that or whatever the right. language was. <laughs> right. uh, whether that was sort of whether it was more direct, you know, he did it, and then they had to change right. it. Um, <laughs> but but I think in the end. The report is still extremely damaging. But the problem was criticism is deserved on House leadership and Democrats because the country was looking for a reaction from Democrats. Everyone's saying, wait for Mueller, wait for Mueller, protect the investigation, protect the investigation. And here comes the report. And the Democrats response is, well, we need more. We need more investigation. We need to. And it wasn't As oh my, opposed to. Oh, my God, he did it. He colluded. Yeah. He obstructed justice. I mean, this is right. how close are we to a definitive decision by the courts that McGahn, say, has to appear? I mean, I mean, uh, because of the subpoena. I mean, if he says if he's testifying in the Senate uh, and, and he says, uh, and I've been subpoenaed by the House managers of the impeachment. And they say, now, um, did the president tell you to tell Rosenstein to fire Mueller? Uh, yes. And, um, and you didn't do it. No. And then the uh, president directed you to write a memorandum for the record saying that he hadn't done that. Is that correct? That is correct. He threatened to fire you, and you thought you were going to go because he wouldn't write the lying memo? That's right. And, um, okay, doesn't that sound like obstruction of justice to everybody <laughs> here? Everybody? <laughs> everybody? <laughs> Mitt? Well, this, this is, <laughs> I, I, mean, think, <laughs> I think you just laid out a reason why they could, should have had Article Three obstruction of justice. And, you know, I think one another reason to do that is because Presumably, it will be if you're having a trial and Supreme Court Justice Roberts is presiding over it, he has the authority to just tell Don McGahn to come. I mean, that's my understanding. You no, know, no, he absolutely does. He absolutely does. 
Um, I mean, you you said about thinking about the courts. The question is whether you will. You, there's well, he's a man of integrity. Well, th- there's an interesting, there's an Sometimes. interesting pattern, which is the lower courts. There have been numbers of decisions saying you have to turn turn over the tax returns to the House. You have to turn over your accounting records in the Cy Vance investigation, the state investigation in New York. There have been you couldn't have stronger district court opinions. But the problem is that the courts of appeals have not done expedited review. In other words, they haven't said why this not. Is on a, well, that's an interesting question. I actually don't Isn't even that... know whether I don't know whether or not the 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 Democrats have even asked for expedited review. I don't know whether how the could they believe. not have what the well, hell? I don't you know I, I don't I don't know. But but essentially, what's happened here is that the Democrats didn't want the Republicans to run out the clock in all of these investigations. It has to be said there really is no legitimacy. Putting McGahn aside for a moment. There is no legitimacy to withholding the tax returns. The statute says shall. There is no legitimacy to withholding a third party that holds the president's records. Really, there's there's no this is not even close. So the Democrats say, you know, this isn't even close. Every court that's going to look at it is going to say this is fine. Why should we wait? But it's not a reasonable argument to say that people don't who are subject to subpoena don't have to show up and at least answer non-privileged questions. If I had witnesses subpoenaed in my court and they said, I don't like the proceeding, I'm not showing up, that just doesn't work. They yeah. would be arrested. <laughs> yeah. It just and doesn't work. And I think this is, you know, I was sort of critical of Democrats for not, you know, jumping on um, uh, the Mueller report right as it came out. And so the obstruction of Congress didn't start with Ukraine. It started with the Russia investigation. It started of with right. the, the un, you know, McGahn not showing up, people not showing up. And Democrats kind of, well, what do we do about this? What do we do about this? And the answer to me was, well, you should begin the process of where we are now. Um, and and so I think the obstruction of Congress is really critical because it's simply, you know, if a future Democratic administration, if this sets the precedent, you know, we just don't have to respond. We don't have right. to provide anything. We'll just do whatever we want. Yeah. I mean, but it really is the difference between, you know, showing up and saying, You asked this question about my conversation with the president. Okay, that could conceivably be executive privilege. But then you also ask this question about what the president told me to say to X or Y. That's not privilege. That's not confidential. And everything that Giuliani says is not privileged. (laughs) Giuliani is, you know, that was functioning, was basically being told by the president to tell certain things to people. When the president says, tell Zelensky to announce an investigation, that's not a privileged conversation. That's a conversation that is intended to be communicated to Zelensky. That's not confidential. Oh, I love, you know what I love to, I love the argument where they go like, yes, Zelensky, he was asked during that time whether he's being pressured and he said no. <laughs> right. That's proof. <laughs> you <laughs> idiots. I mean, they, I, I, oh. I mean, the thing that we sort of always forget in talking about this is that when the president and Rudy did the same thing, and his chief of staff, they came out and just admitted to it. You know, Trump himself, in his own words, came out and talked about the need to investigate Biden, and Rudy said, yeah, I talked and, to you. And Ukraine. you know what's terrible? They, they is, did all. They have admitted to it. And so, and, and what the terrible thing is that they've achieved the same thing. Yeah. Because all they wanted, they, they didn't want Zelensky actually to do an investigation. In fact, they would have preferred that he not. Right. Just announcers investigation. That's enough. Right, right. Yeah, well, I and, think, and I think it result- sort of backfired. I don't think they wanted to have to be impeached over this. And so I think that's where, you know, they have injected this There's into that. Biden. There's that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but they started to run the playbook, which was you just admit to the thing. You just, just sort of say, uh, well, maybe we colluded. But we'll just say no collusion at the same time. You you know kind of there's all kinds of your, collusion. You know, emails are being released about what, what would you call uh, what Roger Stone did exactly I mean Donald Trump Jr. taking a meeting with the Russians with this explicit purpose of getting dirt on Hillary Clinton in the midst of the election is but they collusion. didn't they didn't have any dirt they just it was about adoption just about adoption right. and so the impeachment was important because it brought it out it's now played out. It's now been three months of talking about the president's corruption, which I think is where 
Democrats in the House need to be because the bills they're passing are not becoming law because they're not getting through the esteemed Senate. Um, and so, well, McConnell doesn't want to do it anyway. Yeah, I mean, he McConnell's just blocking, anyway. right? And but the role of the House, what the Republicans did in 2015, is we just recognize that their sole purpose was to try to tear down Hillary Clinton. And so they started a Benghazi investigation. And then that was leading absolutely nowhere until they discovered, oh, what's this weird email address? And suddenly you have an email investigation that then becomes the thing that dominates in 2016. How about the president calling, being on his own phone, phone. Oh, yeah, was silent? I mean, isn't that as bad and, as this? And, uh, that's worse and than I, the email, I think the, the one thing we haven't really talked about is that I think the thing that has, the one real mistake that I think Democrats have made is a lot has been revealed over the last few months, just new stuff, right? Not Mueller investigation, but new stuff. Like Trump basically did the same thing with China, uh, called on the Chinese to investigate Biden. He did it publicly in October, and he did it on the calls as he's negotiating tariffs. But we haven't investigated that. There's also the secret server that then in the White House that has been locking away these embarrassing right. phone, these calls, phone calls, right? not just with Zelensky, but with President Xi, with Putin, with other world leaders. And why can't like that be reviewed by uh, the Intelligence Committee by in both ho uh, houses in the Senate? And they, they review that and go like, OK, because they have clearance, obviously, uh, the chairman and ranking of both uh, intelligence committees. And they listen to that and go like, Holy shit! He is. <laughs> yeah, well, well, right. Fiona, Hill, of crime. Fiona Hill should Barr, be subpoenaed because Barr is standing at the gate with a view of executive power that says they can't even ask questions; they don't have a right to access. And the problem is that in order to 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 deal with that, they're going to have to go into the courts, which then raises the other questions we we're talking about about the delay and how long it would take. Yeah, how long did it take I mean, on the Pentagon Papers? I mean, that's true. It was just a matter of months. That's true. How it's long true. did it I take mean, on the uh, playing the tape, uh, Nixon's tape? How long did that take? It was like, it was under a month, I think. It was very Yeah, quick. no, yeah. I don't. This is actually something that someone should investigate because I can't figure out whether the de Democrats have asked for expedited review and I can't figure out whether courts have turned it down. Um, but but there's really no reason why these issues could not have been taken care of quickly, particularly since, as I said, they're clear. There really is no issue. But, but you know, as part of the impeachment process, right, we did get all these witnesses. People were not coming forward. And yet by opening impeachment inquiry, suddenly career civil servants felt compelled because they were subpoenaed. This is why they had months and months ago on this podcast, I had Dahlia Lithwick and um, Matt Miller. And I was going like, no, you got to do it now. Yeah. Do it now. And, and now an impeachment inquiry. And then you expedite your ability to get right. stuff. They didn't take that step because of Pelosi, because Nancy Pelosi didn't want them to say that. That's the problem. And so therefore by holding. But really, but Al, it didn't matter. They were entitled to this stuff in their oversight responsibility. I mean, that's the thing about, but wouldn't it about the what courts Trump has been doing. I mean, it doesn't it, matter. I mean, when you mm. look at, for example, the tax returns, the statute says shall in response to a House request. It says shall. It doesn't say shall depending what on the What does shall mean really, though? It means you got to do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it means you got to do it. But, you know, Democrats could, write, could right now just issue a whole bunch of subpoenas to all the people who work on Asia policy in the White House and in, in the State Department and say, what do you know about the calls that are on the secret server? And they could do closed door classified depositions and subpoena them as part of the impeachment inquiry. Um, and even after they vote out the articles of impeachment, I, I understand I'm not a lawyer, but you know, when someone's indicted, it's not as if- We only had they, a lawyer. <laughs> it was someone who taught law at, uh, at an esteemed institution. They, no, they could, they could do that, but the problem is what would prevent the Republicans from resisting the subpoena again? I mean, enforcing them to go into the courts. Yeah. Well, and what happens is you'll ultimately win in the courts. But the question is, what does ultimately win and how long does it take? But That's I, the problem. I but I think the one thing here is that the career civil servants started to come forward. Right. They were faced with this choice. So you had the political appointees not come forward. Most of them, uh, the McMulvaney's, but the 
career folks decided, okay, I'm I'm going to come forward. And so I think if you did as the same thing as part of under the House impeachment inquiry, uh, they would come forward on their own. Yeah. But this is where I mean, this is where the Senate trial. I mean, when we go back to like the 1998 impeachment of of Clinton. Oh, how about Turley? Uh, Let's talk about Turley. <laughs> but yes. Yeah. Now, just go- <laughs> let's go to the let's go to the Harvard <laughs> law professor. Uh, what do you think of Turley's testimony? This is Jonathan Turley, who is one of the four uh, constitutional lawyers who uh, appeared before the House Judiciary Committee. Now, he he had uh, been for the Clinton impeachment, right, right? Right, That's right. Did he say anything in his testimony that made you tear your hair out because it so contradicted either what he said or just the whole... What he has said is wrong as a matter of law and evidence that they didn't have enough to proceed um, and, and is, you know, is wrong as a matter of procedure. So to think about you didn't have enough evidence. You have direct comments of the president, both the t- July 25th call and the overheard conversation. You have the comments of co-conspirators, right? Anything that Mulvaney said about the aid is attributable as a co-conspirator to Trump. And likewise, Perry and likewise Pompeo. You have Giuliani's statements, and Giuliani is the president's agent. And when Giuliani says something, it binds the president. You have circumstantial evidence, you know, that the aid was being held up for these investigations based on a reasonable inference, since there was no other basis to do it. And then you have what we call consciousness of guilt, which is the story was that there were there were um, employees in the OMB that were trying to come up with an after the fact explanation for why the aid was withheld. So that so Turley is simply wrong as a matter of law that there wasn't enough evidence to say aid held up because of these investigations, and then to say as he does that the Democrats should have gone through the courts is also I mean is very interesting because. As I said, the, the, the positions the Republicans, ta- Republicans are taking, which is that people don't even have to appear, not that they can claim this privilege or that, but they don't even have to appear to claim the privilege, is flat out wrong, just not even close. Uh, so that the notion that they had to go through a charade to prove what is a, a legal principle for which there is no debate uh, doesn't make any sense. But let, let me, he provided let, the playbook for the Republicans now. He talks about the timing, that this was the quickest uh, impeachment ever, and that's simply not true. Judging at least from the coverage, the Clinton investigation, I think, took, wait, was it 71 or 72 days from the time of the Starr report to the time of impeachment? That's what I heard. I don't know whether that's true. Yeah, I think and this the, was really no different. Yeah, the Starr report, no came, out in, the Star report came out in <laughs> September. There was House Judiciary voted in this is September of 98 House Judiciary voted on the articles of impeachment to pass it out in October. So weeks before the midterm election. And then it was in December that they had the final four vote. That's right. And, you know, I think, you know, just from a political perspective, I think. You know, it was that was so dramatic. If we remember back to the four vote in ninety eight, Bob Livingston, who you know, oh, Gingrich yeah. resigned, and then Livingston's going to be the incoming speaker of the House. And Larry Flint had and put Larry a million Flint had put a million award. dollars, and he'd gotten you know for any Republican congressman that had an affair, and it turned out Henry Hyde, <laughs> who was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, had an affair. That was a youthful indiscretion. <laughs> youthful, youthful indiscretion. And when then he, he was forty, then here was Bob Livingston on the floor, and. You know, he he said Clinton should resign, and Democrats, and this was it was like the British House of Parliament said, "You resign, you resign," and then he resigned, uh, and it was, and so I think actually, and then they, which was great because they got Denny the Hastert, Hastert, they yes. got a really <laughs> yes, uh, uh, really standing upstanding uh, uh, guy who um, was a wrestling coach. Yes, <laughs> um, and I think it's really impacted Pelosi actually. That it has, you know, here you had Republicans went for impeachment and lost two speakers of the House. It was it, this sort of dramatic blowback on Republicans in the House. But I think what, all, the other thing for me about the Clinton impeachment is the House was the interesting part. The Senate, what had happened was sort of Dashiell and Lott got together and everyone was like, we just want this over with because this is like none of us want to be dealing with this. It was a very sort of smooth process. That's not the memorable part. I remember Lindsey Graham uh, in that. Uh, yeah, sort of in the well of the Senate. And Lindsey really was very gung-ho on, on that impeachment. Yeah. And 
question is whether the lessons from the Clinton impeachment apply here. The, the, the Clinton impeachment was, you know, the underlying conduct was fully disgusting. There was no question about it, but it was not the abuse of office. And Clinton actually was functioning as a president apart from this event. This is an abuse of office. This is very, very different. And also, you're starting with a president who's also woefully unpopular. So I'm, I don't, I'm not sure that it's an analogous situation at all, but there's no question that that's what kept, the, you know, that's what she's concerned about. Yeah. And, and I'm not, you know, given Mueller's underperformance, I'm not sure that she was wrong to not to go for impeachment with respect to the Mueller report. Um, you know, this was a much more dramatic. But he could and much have at least story. said, "I can't, I can't indict, but if I could, I would." Mm-hmm. And this now it's what, up to actually, the House. He, he absolutely could have. You know, I mean, as I said, I'm part of that world, right? I was a judge. Um, I, I've been a lawyer. I so fully believe that Mueller, neither Mueller nor Horowitz, understood the ways in which the guardrails have changed. And the people that you expect to be professional and dispassionate, like Barr, are not. I mean, the comment that Barr makes to a report that he helped, that he looked at for at least a month before, and the comments that Durham, who's in the middle of a criminal investigation, made were shocking to Horowitz and shocking to anybody else. That's just not the way it is done. But but Barr is playing to tweet storms and social media and not... His professional obligations. Yeah, I think you were asking before about what to do about Barr. Barr is really a whole other story, fundamentally disappointing and worse story. I think we have to expect that Barr and Durham are the October surprise for 2020 and that they're going to sort of reveal something of some indiscretion related to the Russia investigation, which reveals it was totally a hoax that Trump can use to say, see, he was this victim of the deep state coming after him. And if you reelect Trump in, in 2020, he'll be free of the deep state and will it will uh, cause change. I think just one quick point. The Senate trial in 99 was exceptionally boring, as I think, essentially. There was not much dramatic action happening. The dramatic action happened on the House side. I think this could be the f- reverse, where the House has sort of been, we're just sort of going through the motions at this point. But the Senate trial, and this is where Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, Murkowski, if you want to have, you know, put pressure on them that to have a fair trial and suddenly you're calling, you're able to get the Mulvaney's, uh, the Don McGann's, the the John Bolton's. And so the trial could actually be the much more interesting and potentially explosive part. And we all think this is sort of a predetermined outcome where, of course, the Republicans in the Senate are not going to vote to remove Donald Trump. You know, a lot can happen over the next month in this presidency. I agree. But I also think that there's any meaningful erosion, even not getting to 66 votes, but a meaningful erosion of support so that that looks like the direction things are going in. I, I may be the only one in the world who believes this, but the president has to make an interesting calculation, which is if there is any risk of him either being impeached or any risk of him losing the election, he is facing such substantial legal trouble as soon as he walks out far more serious than anything anyone has ever faced, given the numbers of investigations, that there is a bargain he could strike, which would be, un, you know, an unfortunate bargain where he resigns, Pence pardons him, and he walks off into the sunset. Um, that would be very transactional, and it would, put, it would be the end. He couldn't protect himself against state investigations, but he certainly could fa- fashion that kind of bargain. Okay, you guys, uh, this is to be continued, obviously. Uh, And uh, thank you so much uh, again, Nancy. Uh, uh, Professor, professor, (laughs) former judge, your honor. Goodbye. And (laughs) the asset. They're they're pushing your podcast. The asset. And uh, let me guess who the asset is. Because um, it's either... Oh, Jesus Christ. Is it Trump? It is. <sighs> so he's the asset of the, what, of the Russian government? That's the claim. Okay. I hadn't thought of that. And I think we back it up. Really? Okay. <laughs> okay, well, you have to listen to the asset, but only after you listen to the Al Franken podcast. See you around. 
Well, there you go. That was a, a great one for change. And uh, uh, I want to thank uh, both uh, Nancy and, and Max. And uh, that music you're hearing, Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. And our producer is Peter Ogburn, who uh, family is from the South, and some of them are racist. So thank you for uh, listening, and I hope you uh, uh, listen to our next one, which uh, hopefully will be another good one, you know, for a change. Mm-hmm.